Okay. So this morning we're going to be in the New Testament towards the end of the book, <laughs> um, towards Revelation. It's going to be 1 John. This morning we're going to be in 1 John 2. Starting with verse 15, 1 John 2, starting with verse 15. And the last time the message was titled to truly know God. You know, we've been kind of going through the last few Sundays about explaining to people that they can have a relationship with their creator, right? Even before the Messiah came, even before Jesus, we see the Psalms, we see the Psalms of David, we see him crying out to the Lord. Uh, yes, there was the temple and the priesthood and the sacrifices, but, you know, God has always desired, you know, all the way from Genesis, even when Adam and Eve broke the covenant and sinned, uh, God was still trying to reach them. Cain and Abel, right, after that took place, he was still trying to reach Cain. Uh, so that's the type of God we serve. So, you know, I've been just kind of coming up with, as we go through First John, just these different ways that we can see from a lot of different angles that God does desire a relationship with us. Now, this morning, the message is titled Three Explosive Verses. And as I go through the verses, you'll see what I'm talking about. Uh, and it, you know, a lot of times we talk about, you know, relationship and love and all these great topics. This one's, you know, some people are going to have to take this one to heart because, and again, everyone, including myself, has to read it and take it to heart. Nobody's immune from it. Sometimes God wants to make us better. He wants to purify our character. So through the word, he'll share some things that, you know, that may be a reality check about our own selves and how we might change some things about ourselves to uh, be more, clo be closer to God and be more uh, you know, have a better walk with him. So we're going to look at this in five parts. Jumping in, <laughs> he says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. He's not talking about unbelievers. He's talking about people who profess to know the Lord. We're going to get to that. 16, for all that is in the world, so he kind of qualifies that statement, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father. I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. They're both going. Right? As the Lord sets up his new kingdom, the world is passing away. I mean, look around. Uh, and the lust of the world, but he who does the will of God abides forever. So, one, do not love the world, question mark. I love painting myself into a corner, seemingly, and then speaking about what's going on here. Aren't we supposed to love the world? Didn't God so love the world? John 3, 16, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe on him would not perish, but have eternal life. Well, that Greek word, and there's, uh, there's geis, there's uh, kosmos. Uh, the beautiful thing about the Greek language is it's very expressive. And a lot of these words, in addition to having many layers more than the English, uh, there's also contextual application. So what are we talking about here? Well, we're talking about the world system that's in rebellion against God. So in John 3, 16, God so loved the world, he loves all the people, all the souls that he ever created, right? And he wants them to be saved. So he sends his son, die for our sins. But there's also a, a translation of that word meaning the world system. And this is interesting because it goes back, even back to the Old Testament, which I love to refer to. So in Psalm <laughs> chapter 2, right, the psalmist writes all the way back, thousands of years ago. He says, verse 1, why do the nations rage? You say, about what? Why do the people plot a vain thing? Right, about what? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. So even before the Christ came, it was already understood by God. God sees the future that the world system would try to get to heaven or try to achieve accomplishments by circumventing God. Thank you, God. We'll take your creation, but we don't want you. And we see that today, don't we? Right? So... 
uh, against the Lord and his anointed, saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. So this is what it's talking about in roughly 1000 BC. This world system, the, usually the, the powerful people, right? The ones, the power brokers, the ones that make things happen. The higher somebody gets in this world, I think about the sort of the oligarchical billionaire class, unfortunately, that has bought many of our politicians and politicians overseas. You have enough money, you can make things happen. But in verse 15, it says, don't love the world or the system in rebellion against God. Now, we can go back to the Old Testament again, Genesis 11, starting with Babel, where the nations come together and decide, well, we don't want God. You know, we're going to build the ziggurat. And if you actually study archaeology, there's a lot of ziggurats that are still out there. This sort of structure that uh, went sort of in in circles with stairways and it it would get higher and higher as it got thinner. And it's this idea to, you know, the, the society in Genesis 11 was trying to reach the heavens without God. So God confounded their language and, and scattered them. And then you have nations that rose up and such. And now we have iPhones where you can talk to somebody and it, imagine, it automatically translates. So, you know, man is always trying to angle something when God is saying, you know, pump, pump the brakes a little bit. So this is what you have. So don't love the world or the world system against God. And, and sometimes Christians fall into this. They're like, well, everyone's doing it. And I'm talking about adults. Everyone's saying it. So I feel pressured to go with, with the majority. And that hasn't been the Christian experience for thousands of years. Um, so the system and the things in that system, the stuff, the temporal world. You know, when I think of stuff, I think about when I was a police officer for 25 years, I went to crime scenes, death scenes, unattended, attended death scenes, and inevitably the person was gone they actually left their body behind obviously but they also left things filled in the garage in the attics and the closets and the basements i've never seen one scenario where anyone where the person the relative said yeah they passed and oh, their car went with them you know what i'm saying it stays here you know all the and, and this is how we have to put things in perspective it doesn't mean we can't have things you know, I get the temptation too. Somebody, I, I have a garage. I like to fix things. I got these tools and someone offered me, oh, I'm getting rid of this air compressor. You know, you can attach tools to it. And I, I said, I can't put one more thing in my garage. You know what I'm saying? So oh, I'd love to have an air compressor and you know, the nail gun. And, and I'm thinking just your house isn't big enough. Just, I had to decline it, you know? So uh, it's stuff, stuff, right? And again, it's okay to have stuff, but there's a progression, the things that we have. Do we love our stuff? Does love turn to obsession? Do we obsess over the things we have? Right? Um, Mr. Getty, all the money in the world, guy lived a horrible life when it came to humans, but he had billions of dollars. He was one of the first billionaires, I believe. Um, do we, obsession, does obsession turn to worshiping them and then worshiping them turns into making it a god or a false god, right? And people say, oh, you're making a god out of whatever. And again, I'll be the first one because I know I'm going to tweak some people with this message, but I didn't write it. I agree with it 100%. I will explain it. <laughs> so it's just where we are. You know, early on in, in our marriage, my wife and I, she's going to be laughing at this one. Uh, I had this project car and I think listen, I'm making excuses already for myself You know, I have a little OCD. There's a spot of rust You know, I got to get that off and just make sure it's I'm neutral rusting it and you know, there's a There's there's a rip in the seed. I got to so my wife would affectionately or non-affectionately dub the car the other woman so (laughs) Sometimes people would say, oh, where's Joe? He'd, she'd say, he's outside with the other woman. <gasps> no, it's a car, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so eventually I got rid of the car because it was making me crazy. And the Lord had things for me to do, and I just was obsessing over this stupid car. It's just a car, you know what I'm saying? Uh, so listen, I don't mind throwing myself in there and saying as a newer believer or that, that I had some issues with, with focusing on things when God wanted me to focus on people and focus on him and his 
idea and his love to bring people into heaven. Um, Matthew 6, verse 19, Jesus says, <laughs> He says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal. And this isn't in the scripture, but stock markets go up and down. <laughs> you gain money and you lose money. Uh, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. All right? Your affections will follow your treasures. Are they earthly treasures, stuff, or are they the things of God? Um, and now listen, I have a car and I drive to and fro. I drive to the weddings I'm doing, the funerals I'm doing. Um, so it's a car. It just gets from point A to point B. I need it because I can't, I can't fly yet. But, you know, what's my attitude towards that thing that I have? So here's another thing. What is our relationship with things in the world supposed to be? Well, I'm glad you asked, whoever asked, right? Jesus tells uh, an unusual parable in Luke chapter 16. Some parables, parables are very straightforward. Others, oh, that's interesting. And he talks about this unjust servant who is not a godly man. He's not a believer. And he talks about how this unjust servant manipulates things and stuff to make his life better and his retirement and such. And then he says, as believers, this is how you should handle things and stuff. Not like him, but very different. So he says this, quote, verse 9. Jesus says, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves. So that when it's gone, when the wealth is gone or you die, you will be welcomed into an everlasting home. So in other words, don't worship the temporal things, but use them to bring people into the kingdom, further the ministry in some respects. So the welcoming into an everlasting home is believed, when you take this parable apart, is that the person who uses worldly wealth the proper way that Jesus says and he or she goes through his life or her life, you know, getting people a little closer by using this worldly wealth, that when they die, they'll be welcomed, of course, by the Lord. That's a no-brainer. It's easy. But they'll also be welcomed by some people that they might not recognize that while they were on the earth, they used that worldly wealth to get them a little closer to God. And maybe they brought them into the kingdom, or maybe they were one of those people that somebody else brought them, but they started that foundation. So you're going to be welcomed. All these people, who are they? Well, it's because of you using that unrighteous mammon, as, as the Bible tells us, to help them get a little closer to God. And hey, look, they made it. And they want to welcome you and thank you for what you did. Isn't that cool? Yeah. I mean, this is the Word of God. It's just, it's like, wow. It's, it's, parables were incredible. I did a whole series on the parables. Um, you know, I think about something, I'm not a, listen, I'm not a wealthy man at, by any stretch of the imagination, but if my wife go out, and sometimes it's an opportunity just to meet people. We'll go out to a diner or we'll go out to a restaurant to eat and, you know, there's this whole idea, how much do you tip and stuff like that. And I have these scripture cards and it has the service times of the church. It doesn't have my name. And on the other side, it has these really nice scripture on it. Uh, and I give them out to people that are part of the wait staff. You know, my wife and I will talk to them. And, um, you know, I use the unrighteous mammon. I, I leave, we leave a ridiculous tip more than, right, more than the, the normal. Because if somebody doesn't know the Lord and you just give them a tract, there was actually a video by Casting Crowns about how foolish that is. Here, here's a scripture. We have to think about how other people are thinking. And in the, in the video, she throws it in the garbage because they didn't leave her anything to help to pay the bills. So we will leave a, a, a much more tip than is expected to, and give them a scripture card so that it, it goes down easier. So you're using the unrighteous mammon, which that's their world, to open their eyes and, and Pay, get them to pay attention in a positive way, and I see them walking away, and they'll, they'll be reading the scripture. Okay, all right, we did it, we did it. Um, it is what it is. I never go and I never tip 
and share the things of God if I'm not willing to be generous, even if they did a crummy job. And that's just me. You can have different standards, but I just want some, I don't know what's going on in their life. Could they not pay the bills? Is there a relationship issue? Are they in trouble with the law, the IRS breathing down their neck? I don't know. Maybe there's, you know, so I think I really hit that one as hard as I could hit it. Verse 15b, going back to 1 John 2, he says, he says, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Again, this is not the ungodly, right? Jesus is speaking to believers, and some are deceived about their own relationship with the Lord that they love stuff so much that John's like, through the Holy Spirit, the love of the Father is not in them. Wow. So, churchgoers in every church, um, some have this problem. The love of the Father is not in them. They're so obsessed with their pursuits of pleasure in life that they don't think about other people. They don't think about the, the grand scheme. And you know, the more you're blessed, the more you, sh- you, you should be happy about, wow, God's blessed me. L- let me do this to further the kingdom. And I can't wait in the end to see who made it uh, because we at least were faithful. And he says the love of the Father and the love of the world are what? They're mutually exclusive. They're mutually exclusive. If we love the world and the things in the world, we don't have the love of the Father. And we can share Christian memes all day long on Facebook and platitudes, but God knows. He knows. So we continue on. Um, I would say that some people treat the the starting line like the finish line. In other words, some believe that, well, I'm just going to get saved. Um, I'm going to go up, I'm going to receive the Lord, and that's great. I made it. (laughs) I'm going to heaven. That's true. (laughs) That's true. If you've truly accepted Christ as your Savior, there's no strings attached. However, it's the starting line. It isn't the finish line. We don't now coast our way into the kingdom. We, what is my spiritual gift? How does God want me to use this? You know, know, he's changing my heart. Uh, My relationships are getting better. Uh, I'd like to be a light to those that I love so they can know the Lord as well, right? All these things start to happen. So, you know, receiving Christ is is the starting line. God will use you in a mighty way, especially for those in your life that you love, to to share that light and plant that seed with them. Uh, It's good stuff. Verse 16, he says, For all that is in the world... So this is almost more of a breakdown or subcategories of, in case you were wondering, in this generality, he now explains it. He says, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but it is of the world. So, let's break this down. Two out of five, our points, is the lust of the flesh. Now, this is interesting because in the Greek... The word for body is soma, where we get the word in medical terminologies, somatic of the body. It's the muscles, it's the tissue, it's the brain, it's all the systems of the body is the soma in the Greek. And when just the body is mentioned, the word soma is used. The word soma is not mentioned here. The word sarx is mentioned, still translated in English, right? The flesh or the body, but it goes deeper than that. It's not just basic needs of the body, but it's the old nature that tries to tie itself to those old needs of the flesh through the body. You you see what I'm saying here? And I'm going to explain it more. You know, um, sometimes I'm up here and my stomach is growling, and I don't speed up my message or cut it short because my stomach's trying to tell me what to do. In my mind, I'm like, shut up. In about an hour, we'll eat something. You can make all the noises you want. I'm not doing anything. So you almost kind of get into this thing with your, with your body, right? Um, if you're too hot or too cold, your body will tell your brain, turn on the air conditioner or turn up the heat. I'm uncomfortable. And this is what the body does. The body dictates to us when it's feeling good or not feeling good and what it wants and what it doesn't want. And the brain makes the decision to acquiesce or continue what we're doing. So it's pretty neat. Um, 
The thing is, if all we do is respond to base desires from the body, we're no different than the animal kingdom. And when you read some of these crime stories and you see the horrific nature, people say, what an animal. And I say, don't insult the animals. You know what I'm saying? At least they don't torture each other. They just do it quickly, right? Um, so, you know, we, are, we still have the old nature and the flesh, but it tries to rear its head and tell us what to do a lot. I think about Lot's wife who was saved from the destruction of Sodom and the angel come. Imagine that. Imagine getting visited by an angel and says, hey, I'm going to save your life. Something bad's going to happen. Come on, let's go. Troops, get, get, get out. Let's get out of the city. She's being saved by God. She was being saved by the angel, right? And she's leaving the city and the rest of them are, are moving with the angel in lockstep. I'd be right behind them. And she's lingering and she keeps looking back. At, she's longing for the city even knowing it's going to be destroyed. She doesn't want to be with God. Her heart and her flesh is still in Sodom. And you know the rest of the story. It didn't end well for her. You know? So you, you, you see where we're going with all this. And there's a transition of the desires of the physical body, which are normal, to the desires of the flesh. I'll give you another example. I'm glad I got people sitting in the front. Because uh, so, I like to use them as an example. So I, I, right, sermon's over, I'm really hungry, I look at my wallet, I forgot my credit card, I forgot my cash. Man, I really need from here to go to a place and I want to get something to eat. So I, I might have to wait or ask somebody if I could borrow some money, but if my flesh is really saying we need to eat now and I, I take out a club and bonk Brad on the head and steal his wallet, well, I just made a transition from the needs of the body to doing something of the flesh. Brad's really big, so I don't know if that's, that's going to work out well for me, but I promise I won't do that. <laughs> it's just an example. Right? I just want to uh, share with you, because I love bringing in, I, lo I love the, my son is now uh, going to Brookdale, and he's got these anatomy and physiology and bio classes. I love it, because I, I, I was like, hey, so what'd you learn today, you know? And then we'll, we'll go back and forth. He goes, how do you know that? I said, because I have a passion for it. When you have a passion for something, you remember it. So a few of these articles, I went online, different psych psychology articles, and I'm going to tie this in. I'm not really going off on a tangent here. But those of you that know the main five neurotransmitters that go back and forth and brain the, uh, bathe the neurons of the brain, depending what we're doing, we're involved in what the brain wants from us. One of them, which people talk about a lot, is the, it's called the reward and also the pleasure neurotransmitter, dopamine. Dopamine affects a lot of things. Decision making, it modulates risk, risk, risk ward assessment. Let me, I'm so excited that I'm talking too fast. It modulates risk reward assessments with the brain's prefrontal cortex region. High levels of dopamine can make individuals more inclined to take risks when potential rewards are perceived as significant. And I'll just read two more sentences and then go into really this cool stuff. This article is great. But I went through a lot of different psychology periodicals and psychiatry, and they all say the same thing. Uh, and this is something I knew for years. It says that understanding how dopamine affects mood and motivation provides valuable insights into human behavior and mental well-being. By recognizing the impact of this neurotransmitter, we can develop strategies to enhance mood regulation, increase motivation, and optimize decision-making processes, right? So, a few things that trigger a dopamine response, which flood the brain and make you feel really good. A lot of the pleasure is, is you know, it's in other parts of the body, but it's, it's really main part is the brain. So, one is exercise, right? Some people are addicted to exercise. There's a dopamine response there. Sexual activity is another one. Achievement, right? Workaholics. Some people are, they're driven by achievement. And every time they achieve, it just, it's an obsession with them. Uh, J. Paul Getty was one of those people. Ruined his marriages, ruined his life with his children, but he was achievement oriented. Three, creative pursuits. Somebody creates something. And they look back and they put it on social media and people like it and say, wow, you're so talented. There's a dopamine rush. Uh, adventure and thrill seeking, social interactions, and let's not forget 
if we could put the images up, loving and loving animals. That's Louie. He's my companion when we go for a ride. Look at him. He's so serious. If we could do the next one. That's Louie and Winnie. Heather says, when you talk to the congregation, don't favor Louie over Winnie. So I put, I put this one up too. Okay. Oh, I just got a dopamine rush. Um, and again, some of these are negative and very sadly, drug use, right? Why, why are people addicted to this drug? What, what's up? Because they keep chasing that high. Um, the outdoors and nature. Ha <laughs> ha. Right? This is something we should be teaching people that we love. Get off the phones with the blue light. Oh, I just, I'm just miserable. Go outside. Get some sunlight. Enjoy the oxygen, you know, nature, and all the different things that God has created. So these things bring uh, dopamine response. I'm going to get to why I'm saying all this. So the potential risks and side effects of chasing dopamine highs. One is dependency. Keep chasing it. There's actually... You know, and I know I've dealt with a lot of people in the addictions community. I lost my younger brother through addictions, sadly enough. He's my, he was my baby brother. Um, chasing the high, and, and there's been movies made about this. The diminished rewards, uh, people who take uh, opioids, you know, and that first injection, they get this flood of, of dopamine and they take risks, and they take more, and they get it from questionable people because they keep chasing that initial high. Sometimes when you educate people, it helps them to break these cycles. Oh, that's why I'm doing that. Yeah, check this out, article out. Three, impaired decision-making, taking too many risks. Four, mental health issues like anxiety and depression because you can't live 24 hours in this type of situation. Uh, five, neglecting other areas, right? Important areas. Does God know us or what? So what does God do? He says, listen, I, I created your body, created your mind, created your spirit. I want you to enjoy your life, but you have to put everything in its proper compartment, you know? And well, what humans try to do is overachieve in one area or overdo uh, in one area to keep chasing that high and then everything falls apart. Right? There was, uh, I didn't see the movie, and I'm not really a fan of the actor, but there was a real uh, Wolf of Wall Street. His name is Jordan Belfort, and he's sometimes in the news. He went to federal prison. He was working on Wall Street, and he made all this money, but he did it unscrupulously. And when everything, he went to prison, he had a lot of time to think, he started doing interviews, and he said, you know, you can do whatever you want in this country. He goes, if I just would have slowed down and just waited and not been so impatient, I wouldn't be in prison right now and I'd still be wealthy. It's interesting, isn't it? So God knows, right? God knows we can't live in the dopamine highs and the flesh wants us to live in that. And God tells us, not only is it not good because you're ignoring God and you're worshiping some inanimate object that most likely he created, but you're also hurting yourself. Right? God is not a cosmic killjoy. He wants us to enjoy our lives. But how much is enough? How much is too much? So a little, little jump here. Uh, I think about, right, and I'm just going to go through some of these sexual activity. God made sex and marriage to enjoy, but outside of marriage, adultery, divorce, ruined families, sex crimes. I dealt with that as a law enforcement officer deviant behavior, hurting other people because you're chasing something that's hurting somebody else, right? Um, the same dopamine rush that can be elicited during drug use, check this out, can also be elicited leading a person to Christ. Amen. Yeah. I'm telling you, when, when a lot of times I plant seeds, I don't expect the person to jump and say, yes, I want to receive Jesus. You know, People need time. They need not to be pushed. But I tell you what, when somebody comes up to receive the Lord, it's such a good feeling. It's, it's beautiful. And it is. There's a dopamine response in that because you know somebody just got into the kingdom. That's, that's super cool if we really wrap our minds around it. Food pleasure, right? Love. Is, watch the cooking channels. These chefs, it's, they're like, wow, man, that looks delicious, right? You can almost taste it through the television. 
Um, but the monarchs in Europe would, uh, they, were, they would commit gluttony and vomit and then eat again because so, it felt good to eat food. That's weird. Sleeping and rest, I love taking a nap, but laying around all day and being lazy is, is harmful to your family and the bills won't get paid that way. You know, so there's a, there's a lot to this. Um, and we have to ask ourselves, what is driving me viscerally to the point of obsession? Is there something in my life that I have to really think about and give it to the Lord in prayer alone with him and ask him to help me in that area because I'm starting to worship it, I'm starting to obsess, right? So um, we have one of our, our teens here today, and it was so cool when you know, he contacted me after last Sunday's message it's so great when you know you're reaching the youth. And he said, you know, Pastor Joe, and he, he, was very, he was very detailed about what he liked about the message. And he said, he said you know, you, you said something about Christians were very good at not doing the bad things, right? I don't think anybody in this room is, lately is, do not murder, stole from somebody, do not do this, do not do that. And we're good at that. But sometimes we're not always good in the do. Right? What should we be doing? We forget that. Well, I didn't kill anybody. Christians say that stuff too. But are we, are we lifting a finger to help somebody else and make their life? And not that we're, we're, we want to pad everyone's lives because that doesn't work either. But am I doing anything in my relationships with what the Lord has blessed me with to help them to get closer to the kingdom of heaven? So thank you for that. It's always great to get the feedback. So three is uh, three out of five is the lust of the eyes. So we did the lust of the flesh. Now let's look at the lust of the eyes. This gets very interesting. Matthew 6, 22, Jesus said that the eyes are the lamp or another translation, the eyes are the illuminator of the body. But here we see it works in both directions. The eyes are both transmitters. You can tell a lot by someone's expressions and, and you see things in their eyes. Eyes are in a very interesting machine that God created, but they're also receptors. They take images in. It goes, uh, you know, the, the lens takes it, it processes it, it focuses it, it sends it back to the retina. You've got the rods and the cones. There's a, a clarity there. You get the vitreous and the aqueous humor. Um, you know, there's so many things in the eyes that process every single image, depth perception. You got two eyes, it's stereo. And then it sends it across the optic nerve into the brain. And the brain immediately processes it. It processes it. And it says, I like it, I don't like it. And if I like it, why do I like it? And sometimes the, those images can come out in dreams. They're so clear. That snapshot or that video that the eye took and downloaded it into the brain. In a split second, the brain will decide whether that house or that car, or that person you're attracted to, that food, that vacation, which all these things are innocuous, are something pleasing, and whether it drives the human in the flesh to obsess over it. And then you get the cycle all over again, which we're trying to break, according to this. Um, advertisers. Did you know that advertisers, it's actually not a multi-billion dollar industry. It's a multi-trillion dollar industry when you look at advertising in the world. Did you know that advertisers hire psychologists? Oh yeah, oh yeah, because they want you to buy their product. And they want those groups of people that they pay good money for to tell the advertisers of the product what will get in, in, the, in the 30 second commercial, what will get these people to jump and jump on Amazon? and get it overnighted to their house. It's so, it can be so destructive advertising that did you know that certain things are illegal in the United States to advertise? Certain things that are addictive, certain things that can draw youth in. And there's a big debate going on about that. Well, censorship versus kids are jumping on this and they don't have the maturity to say no to that yet. What, what are our kids seeing? These images in their eyes. There's uh, two commercials that I want to reference. One is, it's like Lindor chocolates. I love chocolate. <laughs> Do me a favor. I know you guys like me. Don't buy me any chocolate. Because when I eat too much of it, I get a migraine. 
But there's that one commercial where the chocolatier is, it's melted chocolate. And he's spinning it and it's wet and I just want to put my face in there, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm like, oh, this commercial's killing me. Oh, I got a better one. I really like when I'm really hungry, a nice steak. And there's another commercial and there's all these different places and just the, enough red in the center and there's this commercial where you see the steak and there's stuff on the top of it and it's sizzling. And if I close my eyes, I can smell it. I can taste it. I'm having a moment. Just give me, give me. It's powerful. You know, and I believe I'm pretty good at resisting things, what I do for a living. But, you know, I just look at that and I'm like, I, I could, it's in my taste buds. I remember the taste of it. I could smell the, oh my goodness. All right, I'm, I'm done with that. I think I just got a dopamine rush. You know what I'm saying? Oof. So the eyes are a direct gateway to the mind. It, it's, it's very close, right? Close to the brain and, and how the mind processes these things. I think about... Uh, how many people know who Charles Templeton, I think he's passed away, Charles Templeton, right? So Charles Templeton was the, you know, the, the, the wingman to Billy Graham back in the day and sharing the gospel, and he led a lot of people to Christ. I think Charles Templeton's weakness was he was, I'm saying this objectively, I think he was a handsome guy, young, handsome guy, and all of a sudden he started moving away from the things of the Lord. He had, uh, I think he had, he was on his third wife. Uh, he, he, you know, his relationships weren't good. He just kept going through different women. He uh, got involved with worldly people, with, you know, all these academics. You see all the pictures of him at the universities. He, he let the world pull him away from the things of Christ. You want to hear how powerful Jesus Christ is? So there's a guy named Lee Strobel, and he, another genius, Harvard educated, journalist, uh, investigator, wife becomes a Christian, he flips out, no way, we talked about this, we're not raising the kids religious or whatever. So she goes, no, it's Jesus, it's not religion. And he went on a quest for like two years to try to disprove Jesus. He did all of this evidentiary research and found out that Jesus is real. He became a Christian. Lee Strobel interviewed Charles Templeton a few months before Charles Templeton, he, be, he became sickly before he passed away. Well, he was too old, so the, the women thing was kind of gone, right? He was frail. The, uh, the educational pursuits, his mind was going from the sickness. He probably couldn't remember most things that he prided himself on. And one of the last things he said before he died, he said to Lee Strobel, he said, I miss Jesus. Jesus doesn't exist. This guy had everything. He had money, he had the opposite sex, he had educational pursuits. At the end of his life, he said, I miss Jesus. Now, I'd like to believe that he turned back to Christ before he died. I don't know the answer to that. Uh, but Jesus is powerful. Because especially when this, everything is gone, he's the one who's going to last forever. Not your stuff, not your relationships. <laughs> okay. I just, and I sometimes TMI, I'm just thinking about some stuff that I have and I'm like, where did I put that, you know, drawer? And I save everything. I save pieces of plastic, a piece of metal I find on the street. And my wife's like, you're, you're like a hoarder. I'm like, look at you, look at, you know, you know, we, we both, <laughs> but it's like, I, I know I could use this. And then I find a piece of something, plastic or metal or wood. And I'm like, I build something. And she goes, and I say to her, see, it's a good thing I didn't throw it away. But we're not, I don't obsess over this stuff. I just, in case of a rainy day. All right, let's move on. That is too much information. But I wonder how many churchgoers, right, in any, every church, if they knew they would die today or even be raptured today, if they would regret how they lived for themselves up until this point, and if they had the desire, knowing that they would die today or be raptured today, if they would actually think, I really want to change. I got to tell you something, if that's you, today, oops, we're still here. <laughs> um, nothing happened. Nobody fell on the floor. There's still time. And, and that's what God's word is for, not to beat us down, but to get us to think, meditate, and to change. Amen? Amen. So, four, the pride of life. This is, the, this is the way I look at it. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes in reverse. 
when it says pride of life. What's pride? If you take apart that Greek word, it means vainglory. It means boasting. It means bragging. It means ostentatiousness. In this, you elevate yourself above everyone else to make them jealous. And maybe it's not doing it consciously. Maybe it's subconscious. This I call the social media principle. I'm great. Look at me every day. Everyone else is a loser. I've actually followed psychiatry and psychologists who study social media since it started and said it produces a rise in narcissism. We become the, the kings and queens of, of social media. We thrive, we get rushes on all the likes that we receive, right? Now listen, I, I use, uh, you know, some people use it for ministry. You know, we, the church uses it so that we could get prayer requests out. We could tell people about the messages coming up, the itinerary. So it's nothing's not, it's innocuous. It's innocuous. It depends on what you do with it. Are you serving the Lord with it? Are you, you know, honoring God or is it just all about you? Uh, narcissism also dissociate, dissociative disorder and derealization disorder. That obsession on social media can cause a lack of reality. Right? The person is they're on the computer all day and they, they, they can't interact at their jobs. They can't interact with relationships. Some of you are in the, in the mental health field and you know this. You see this. Um, some who are churchgoers, they make themselves feel better by posting a Christian meme once in a while. But we don't live our Christian walk by memes. A person who succumbs to this can be very worldly, very shallow with no substance. And my experience has been some who are not only they, they have difficulty in their jobs, difficulty in relationships, but sometimes they have difficulty in the church. They're so self-focused that, you know, to explain, well, the church is we all work together to glorify God. What I'm doing up here, yeah, it's, it's my gift, but the, you got the worship team, you got the ushers, the children, they're, till, they're teaching people right now while we're up here. You got video person, you got, I mean, we have great people here. It's, it's not the Joe show. We all work together. And if you wanted to serve here, a little plug for volunteering, we'll find a place for you. You know what I'm saying? Uh, but there are some that if they don't get disproportionate attention, it doesn't go well. And they, you know, they fall off. Uh, I've also seen celebrity pastors and ministries engage in this garbage. I never want what I do in my personal life or on social media or up here to make anyone else feel like they're less than me. Never. Never. But I've seen it. Um, some of these guys, they never leave their ivory towers, rub elbows with the peasants, and that's not Christianity. I even think about, uh, I, and I always quantify what I say. So my, my wife, she rescues dogs, cats, horses. <laughs> Uh, people say, you have horses? And I'm like, yeah, but they're not young, fine Arabian stallions. We couldn't afford that. Our horses are going to the slaughter truck. You know, you can literally get them for free. Now, I probably just made a headache for some of you parents, for some of you teens. This is Pastor Joe said we can get a horse for free. I mean, <laughs> you got to set everything up. And if you're willing to do the work, it can work out. But, you know, even when I talk about that, I downplay it. Because, you know, they're, they're senior citizens, the horses. They're done. You know, they, they're discarded. So that's just how I, I kind of live. I don't want the pride of life. I don't want anybody to look at me and elevate me or, or you know, I just, it's just not me. But the pride of life is a person feeds off wanting others to look at them and even want admiration and, and maybe jealousy. And the attitude is, look at me, look at me, look at me. Verse 17, last part. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it, they're both going. But he who does the will of God abides forever. So five out of five is what is eternal and what is destroyed? And which side do you want to be on in the end? Do you want to be on the team that looks like they're winning, but it's only going to last a few more months or years? Or do you want to be on the team that, from your perspective, maybe it doesn't even look like they're winning, but that's the eternal team? That's the team I want to be on. And instant gratification will, will bring us to the team that looks like it's doing good right now. But we have to weigh all these things out. Um, again, we can enjoy our lives, but the never-ending accumulation, chasing pleasure, chasing pursuits, just like Charles Templeton in the end, 
it was all gone and he missed Jesus because that was the only thing that stood the test of time. And I hope that he received Christ before he died. So let me just say this as well. Warren Wiersbe tells a story about, it's a true story about a young pastor who seemed like everything was going great. He was hungry for the Lord. He was, you know, he was, he had the heart. He, you know, witnessed to anybody, ministered to anybody. And he, his ministry plummeted. So he was interviewed many years later and they asked him, where's the point that everything went south? And his answer was, well, I got this gig at a church. I got a position. I got the parsonage. I got all the accoutrements that go with it, you know, and everything in life was going great. And I said in my heart, I hope the Lord doesn't come back for a while. I hope the rapture doesn't take place. I'm having too good of a time. He said this about himself. I love honesty. And everything started to fall from there because his heart and his hunger, he lost it. It was gone. I'll leave you with this one point. And I should have said this at first because, uh, well, some listening today, and it could be we have a much larger audience on the live stream. Somebody gives it to a friend. Um, some of you listening today like following the flashy pastors and the flashy celebrity ministries, right? And I've seen this. They take pictures of themselves. They take pictures of the fancy cars. They take pictures of all the things that they do. And you like it because they're justifying how you feel. Every once in a while, these things need to be said. You like those flashy pastors because they're justifying the pride of life. And I got news for you. Those pastors will stand before God for their behavior because what's in scripture, listen, I read the whole Bible. I'm like, if I'm going to be responsible for this, I need to know what, what I'm running into by doing this. And when you read it, you realize, you know what, this applies to all of us. Um, so I don't, I don't do that. I don't like that. I don't think it's a good thing, uh, but people can justify their behavior. True religion, James 1.27, pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their need, the needy, and to keep what? Unspotted or undefiled by the world, right? We're not supposed to live lives being defiled by the world, but to be undefiled, you know? And, and whatever the Lord gives me, I'm always going to think of even beekeeping, like people in my neighborhood, like, you have bees? I'm like, yeah. And I rope them into my web. Let me show you the bees. <laughs> the way God created them. And believe it or not, they're little insects and they do things in the dark. They engineering marbles and feats and God and da 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 da. And they look, and they're little bee brains. So you probably couldn't see it if you saw a bee brain, but look how they work together. I will use whatever God gave me my animals, my insects, my tools whatever it is, to use that unrighteous mammon to try to get somebody a little bit closer to the things of God. So let's ask ourselves this question before we leave. Do I love the world? Do I love the things of the world? Do I love them more than I love God, more than I love others, and more than the ministry that God has me that I'm not using because I'm so obsessed with the world and the things of the world? And only we can answer that question. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, this stuff is amazing. Three explosive verses, and there's a whole Bible full of verses. Lord, and you know, you just want the best, best for us. You're not trying to rain on our parade or be a wet blanket. You, you know, you, again, even reading some of those reports about the study of the brain and how it works, and you had this wired from the beginning and you knew that if we could enjoy life within the confines of what you say is good and what's evil, that we'll actually live a fruitful life. But I just pray right now, if there's anybody here who doesn't know Christ as their savior. And I think about the people on the live stream that watch too. And, you know, um, we, we always give an opportunity for somebody to come forward and receive Jesus as their personal savior. So we just ask right now, you could be new to this church. Honestly, this, we don't, there's no strings attached, 
right? You don't even have to come back here. But if you want to receive Jesus, come to the front. Just come to the front right now. Maybe somebody will walk up with you. And just, we'll just lead you in a few verses and, or a short prayer. And it's, it's not even a formula. It's really a reflection of your heart that you want him. We're just kind of facilitating it for you. But you don't go through us. You go directly to the source. So come up to the front right now. Maybe somebody will come up with you. Receive the one who's eternal, who stands the test of time. And when everything else is gone, he's still standing. And his arms are still open to you. You come up if that's your desire. Just so you know, if you're wrestling with it, just, just come. And this, is, this part of the, the service is it's a celebration. Whenever somebody comes forward, everybody claps. I don't tell them to. I don't have a sign that says applause. You just do it because it's a joyful thing. So if you want to come up, come up. If you have more questions, you're contemplating it, see me after service. And um, let's just, let's all stand. I just want to pray something and then we'll will come out with the last song. Let's just, let's just pray this prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, the word is so powerful, Lord. And, you know, we're human. You know, starting with me, we're all frail. We're all subject to just going off the wrong path, Lord. I just pray right now for everybody here. Lord, if there's anything in our life that we keep saying, I, I really should, I've got I to get right with the Lord. I, I really, and, and we just, the months go by, the years go by, and we keep saying the same thing, Lord. I just pray that you fill us with your Holy Spirit, that you refresh our lives and our ministry, refocus our thoughts, reprioritize what we deal with every day in life, and uh, help us to, you, what you want, you don't want us to be condemned through the scripture, you want us to change, and to, to be in freedom and and joy that we're leading others into the kingdom. So with all these things, we thank you and praise you. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Let's remain standing for one.